The U.S. change of tack on Syria that we mentioned a moment ago, in part, say analysts, to a stepped-up presence by Russia. U.S. military officials now quoted as saying the Russians have deployed drones, two more dozen fighter jets, as well as 2,000 military personnel around Latakia to help keep that stronghold of the Assads from being cut off from the capital. The Wall Street Journal now reporting that satellite photos show Russian military forces developing two additional bases in Syria. And of course, this all comes one day after the visit by the Israeli prime minister to Moscow. All Russia's actions in the Middle East region have always been and will be very responsible. We are aware that there has been shelling of Israeli territory and we condemn this. As far as I understand, homemade rocket launchers are being used for this. Given the circumstances, I thought it was important for me to come here to clarify our position and do everything so that there are no misconceptions between our forces and yours. And I would add that in all the contacts we have had, when we agreed and when we had some disagreements, our dialogue was held in an atmosphere of mutual respect. Well, for more, let's cross to Washington and Jeffrey White. He's a defense fellow at uh, the uh, Washington Institute. Before I ask you about Netanyahu's visit to Moscow on, on Monday, uh, this breaking news that we're getting, the Wall Street Journal confirming uh, reports that uh, were first uh, surfaced on uh, f uh, through Jane's, IHS Jane's, saying that uh, Russia is now developing two additional military bases, uh, this in a previously undisclosed uh, uh, expansion, near Syria's Mediterranean coast. What's your reaction? Well, I, I think what we're seeing is the establishment of a, of a large scale Russian uh, logistics and, and air facility uh, inside of Syria. Uh, the number of aircraft that are coming in probably cannot be uh, very well accommodated at, at the uh, Basel al-Assad International Airfield in Syria. So it's logical that they would begin uh, expanding uh, to other areas. There's been speculation that they uh, might have, have combat aircraft uh, operating or, or deployed uh, deeper inside Syria, uh, but that has not yet uh, been been confirmed. But the basic point is the Russians are building up this large military uh, you know, facility and a significant military capability uh, inside Syria. And Pentagon officials very careful in their wording, Jeffrey White. They're saying that they're not quite sure what the ultimate aim of the Russian forces is. Well, I, th I think they're, you know, being cautious and don't want to get out ahead of the uh, policymakers across the river. Uh, I think it's, if it isn't confirmed, it's pretty darn clear that the, the Russians intend to intervene directly in the war in Syria, uh, that the objective is first to support the Assad regime, uh, to help it remain in, in power. Uh, maybe there are other uh, political and military objectives but the commitment of combat forces into Syria indicates that they intend to fight and that they're going to fight in defense of the regime. But, but again, especially when it comes to using air power, uh, we know that uh, the insurgency is mixed in with the civilian population. We know that uh, the Assad government has launched barrel bomb attacks on those civilian populations. Is this the same thing that the Russians are going to be doing? Uh, I, I don't think the Russians will stick to our standards for uh, minimizing collateral damage. I wouldn't say that they'll engage in the same kind of attacks that the regime has, and they should have the capability for more accurate, more precise uh, strikes on uh, rebel combat forces. But I don't think that's, that's going to be their uh, concern. Uh, the Russian concern is going to be to destroy rebel forces, to save positions that the regime deems important, to help the regime retake places it's lost. They're there to fight. It's, it's going to be a combat mission. And uh, I, th I think that's, that's clear. And uh, that brings us back to, of course, that visit on Monday by the uh, Israeli prime minister. In the past, Israel has not hesitated to send its fighter jets into Syria when it felt its uh, interests uh, were under threat. 
either from the Syrian regime or from Hezbollah. Um, they talked, it seems, about, quote, coordinated measures to prevent miscalculations that could trigger a wider war. What, what, what do you think is the deal that was fleshed out? It's, you know, obviously we, we don't have real confirmation or, or any fleshing out of the details. But it looks to me that uh, they've agreed, you know, at least to talk about what they're doing, uh, to let the other one know where they intend to fly and to, and to operate, uh, to either control the possibility of any kind of confrontation or, or encounter by delimiting uh, areas or perhaps by uh, not just simple notification that we're going to be in this area at this time, you know, flying. Um, other than that, it, it's it's hard to say. Uh, it's possible that the Russians and Israelis struck an agreement, for example, that the Israelis won't fly in Latakia province, where the Russian base facilities are, uh, but and the Russians said, okay, you could fly in the Damascus area or along the Lebanese border and other places. Uh, we just need to see, uh, you know, how this is uh, how this is going going to work out. But it you know, it indicates, you know, to me that for sure that the Israelis accepted that the Russians are going to be operating in a military fashion over parts of Syria. All right. So the, the Israelis worry that uh, there could be uh, a moment when both they and the Russians find themselves on the same battlefield. Now we know next week when he speaks to the United Nations that the Russian president Vladimir Putin is expected to spin all of this as part of the war against ISIS. Uh, he's uh, due to talk about, for instance, uh, taking back the ancient city of Palmyra. Could there be U.S.-led coalition forces that wind up on the same battlefield as the Russians? Well, sure, in, in the same uh, battle space, if the Russians actually do uh, conduct operations against ISIS, uh, that raises the possibility of, of us in, of flying in the same areas that the Russians are flying in, uh, and, and so on. And, and there would be need, need, there would need to be a deconfliction of that by by the forces in, in, involved. Uh, in my mind, though, it remains to be seen what the Russian intentions are regarding ISIS. Now, ISIS is not the primary threat to the, uh, the Syrian regime. ISIS is not any kind of special immediate threat, whatever, uh, you know, to Russia. And inside Syria, there are much more dangerous and problematic, uh, for the regime anyway, forces that are closer to Damascus, that are involved fighting the regime every day on a number of fronts that are pressing the regime, that the regime is losing territory. It seems to me that it's more likely that the, the Russians are going to go after those people, those forces, rather than launch headlong in, into a, a campaign against ISIS. And, 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 and Jeffrey White, one final question on this. What should the West do if the Russians tip the scales in places like Aleppo and Latakia? Well, first of all, it would have to summon its courage, right? Um, because if that happens, then we have a, a choice, whether to acquiesce and say, okay, um, we'll, we'll let that happen, and the Russians will kind of won the game uh, in, in Syria, or we'll resist it. Uh, we'll fight back. Uh, we will declare, the, tell the Russians uh, they can't do that. We won't, we won't tolerate it and, and uh, indicate that we're ready to confront them. I think the latter, uh, confronting them, is extremely unlikely, and particularly with the U.S. administration, and I, I think unlikely from any uh, power in Europe as well. Jeffrey White of the Washington Institute, many thanks for joining us.